Hi everyone and a warm welcome to Fun of Flying. In this video we'll be looking at the Touch Portal application once again and in particular I would like to show you my latest project where I've created from scratch a full suite of custom buttons for the Cessna 172 in X-Plane 11. In this case the aircraft concerned is the Cessna 172 specifically fitted with the Garmin GNS 530 flight management system. Before we carry on though, if you're not sure how to find, download, install or use the desktop touch portal application then please by all means take a look at my other videos that cover all of these issues in more detail. Further, as I always try to make clear, for any custom buttons or custom pages to work properly in touch portal you will also need to be aware of how the various keyboard commands are structured in your version of X-Plane 11 and how to create new keyboard commands if these are necessary. In my case I've created a whole new list of keyboard commands for the Cessna 172 aircraft using a new dedicated keyboard profile in X-Plane 11 that is unique to this particular project. By doing it this way I can always go back to the default keyboard profile if I'm flying this aircraft in future and want to use my standard physical keyboard and not my iPad with the touch portal application loaded on it. I should point out at this stage however that there are a few things in the cockpit for which I have not created a custom button and the first group of items relates to basic flight controls such as pitch, yaw and roll. It really wouldn't make sense for me to create buttons for this as I presume that most flight simmers would already have access to a hot ass joystick or alternatively a yoke and rudder pedals. The only exceptions here are the autopilot disengage button, the throttle and mixture controls and pitch trim for which I have actually created some custom buttons. Now I'm not sure about you but when I'm flying the Cessna 172 Skyhawk there are a number of uh, cockpit instruments that I very rarely use. Consequently as it was important for me to consider just how much button space I had available when creating this particular touch portal project I had no choice but to omit those instruments. Accordingly the second group of items that I have not actually created any custom buttons for are as follows. The adjustment knob for the airspeed indicator and also for the attitude indicator. The push buttons on the chronometer. The adjustment knob for the VOR2 OBS receiver and for the ADF receiver. Push buttons for the auto switching panel. Uh, the knob for the GNS530 audio volume control. Nothing for any of the push buttons and rotary encoders on the GNS430 FMS as that just would have taken up far too much space. Uh, the push buttons for the transponder, although this is one that I really did want to try and include and maybe I'll do that uh, on another version. Um, none of the panel brightness control knobs, the fuel selector switch or the fuel cutoff knob. Now I realise that this seems like quite a lot of items but in my opinion uh, they weren't absolutely essential for this project and I suspect that most simmers can get by without them as a touch portal activity. In any event if you did still want to control these items somehow then you could always fall back to your physical keyboard. Anyway let's have a look at what I have created custom buttons for. Uh, which to my mind seems to be quite a lot and also in my opinion uh, probably more than sufficient for most flight simmers flying the Cessna 172 Skyhawk. Now I've tried to keep everything uh, on one page in touch portal that is just to make life easier and I've also tried to group certain custom buttons together to keep things as organized as possible. So with that in mind here is my first list of keyboard commands that I've created for this project. These particular commands that you can see on the screen now are set up to activate most of the general cockpit switches and controls that are found in a Cessna 172 which in a few cases granted uh, required me to overwrite some of the default keyboard commands as originally programmed by Laminar Research. So far though I have to say this hasn't caused me any particular issues. 
The second list of keyboard commands that I created have been set up specifically to operate most of the functions for the Garmin GNS 530 flight management system. Now as far as this lot was concerned, there was clearly a limit to how much I could do with Touch Portal, certainly in terms of creating custom buttons that will operate say uh, a dual rotary encoder with the integral push button for example. Um, or a five position ignition switch or any other type of rotary switch for that matter. Take my word for it, creating and programming custom buttons for toggle switches is much easier than it is for the other items I've just mentioned. So moving on then, this is the custom button page that I've created in my Touch Portal desktop application and we'll just have a quick tour around the page just to show you what's what. Top right is the Cessna Textron logo button, which seems simple enough, but behind it is an instruction to take you back to the main Touch Portal homepage when you're actually operating this from your iPad or similar. This button has a single press and release logic. The four rotary knobs at top center are for the uh, directional gyro and heading bug, as used on the heading indicator gauge the barometric pressure setting for the altimeter and the VOR1 OBS receiver. Each of these actually consists of two buttons in Touch Portal, one commanding a clockwise movement and the other a counterclockwise movement. They are also programmed with a press and hold logic. The 12 push buttons immediately below that are for the Garmin GNS530 flight management computer and all of these have been programmed with a single press and release logic. The GNS530 dual rotary encoder on the left, plus its smaller push button immediately above it, actually takes up to a total of five custom buttons in Touch Portal. These control the COM1 and NAV1 radio frequencies, with two of the custom buttons adjusting the megahertz frequency up and down and another two custom buttons adjusting the kilohertz frequency up and down. All four of these buttons have been programmed with a press and hold logic. Lastly there is a small push button above which switch switches between COM1 and NAV1 as required and this is programmed with a single press and release logic. On the other side there is another rotary encoder with integral push button also made up of five custom buttons in touch portal. The logic behind these is the same as for the other rotary encoder only these in practice allow you to navigate through the menu chapters and pages of the GNS530 flight management computer. To the right of that is the map range control which is made up of two custom buttons one of which zooms the map in and the other zooms it out again. The programming behind these buttons is a single press and release logic. Center left is the uh, primary ignition switch which is made up of just one large custom button although the programming behind this one button is more complex than the others. The way that I have set this up will allow you to press the custom button just once initially and the logic behind it will cause the switch to rotate clockwise from the off position to the right magneto position then to the left magneto position and then to the both magnetos position with a one second or 1000 millisecond delay between each movement. The switch will automatically move then from both magneto position to the start position and hold it there for one and a half seconds or 1500 milliseconds giving the engine enough time to fire up. After that the ignition switch simply goes back to the both magnetos position again and stays there until you press this large button again later on when you've finished flying. When you do finally press this large button again it is programmed with logic to move the switch back from the both magnetos position to the off position in one second increments. Obviously before the ignition switch is operated to start the engine in the first place the aircraft must be set up as necessary for it to work as intended i.e. the throttle and mixture controls need to be set correctly, the battery and the fuel pump needs to be switched on. When turning the ignition switch off then a similar thing applies only in reverse, well sort of. 
In the centre of the screen there are six autopilot push buttons, each of which is made up of just one custom button in Touch Portal and all programmed with a single press and release logic. Immediately to the right of these there is the autopilot vertical speed adjustment knob which is made up of two custom buttons in Touch Portal and the programming here has a single press and release logic for each custom button whereby one increases vertical speed and the other decreases it. To the right of that again is the autopilot disengage switch which is programmed with a press and hold logic. This button only disengages the autopilot and does not re-engage it. To do that you need to press one of the other autopilot push buttons. Below that, slightly left of centre, are the throttle and mixture controls, each of which is made up of two custom buttons in Touch Portal. The programming in this case provides for a press and hold logic so that you can simply hold the push button side of the throttle and or mixture control for as long as needed to smoothly increase both settings. By holding the pull button side of the throttle and or mixture control for as long as needed this will decrease both settings again very smoothly. You'll see what I mean by this later when I actually demonstrate the buttons in action whilst inside the X-Plane 11 application. To the right of that there is the elevator trim turn wheel or as best as I could make one look anyway. This again is made up of two custom buttons in Touch Portal, the programming behind which provides for a press and hold logic. You then simply press the nose down or nose up buttons on the elevator trim control for as long as needed to attain the desired setting. At centre bottom there are seven toggle switches as labelled, all of which take up just one custom button in Touch Portal and all of which are programmed with a single press and release logic. Press a button once to turn the switch on, press it again to turn the switch off. At bottom right there are the two avionics switches which can be operated independently of one another. These switches are made up of four custom buttons in Touch Portal, each programmed with a single press and release logic. The button top left switches the avionics bus 1 on and button lower left turns it off again. For avionics bus 2 a similar thing applies. Lastly and perhaps one of the most difficult challenges I had relates to the master battery and alternator switches. I say difficult because in the real aircraft if you switch the alternator on it also switches the battery on automatically at the same time i.e. you can't have the alternator switched on unless the battery is switched on as well. Similarly, you can't switch the battery off unless the alternator is also switched off. So guess what? Yes, I've had to find a way of programming these custom buttons in such a way as to mimic what happens in the real world or even in X-Plane 11. Outside of these requirements though, both switches can otherwise be operated independently of one another. Phew! Are you still with me? That was a lot to take in, although things may become a little easier to understand when I go through the real thing in X-Plane. So now we're in uh, Touch Portal Live mode and this is a recording directly from my iPad. We're starting on the main page onto which I have created a simple navigation button behind the Cessna Stroke Textron logo which will take us from here straight to the Cessna 172 page that we're interested in. If you recall I have also created a similar button on the Cessna 172 page to get back to the main page again like so. So now we're in X-Plane 11 uh, in our little Cessna 172 Skyhawk and I'm currently located at a small airport called Cranfield which is about 60 miles north of central London. What we're going to do now is to go through the engine start process in stages clearly showing you which touch portal custom buttons I'm pressing at any time and what each actually does in the aircraft cockpit. Initially we will switch on the battery and the fuel pump then set the mixture to full rich and lastly crack the throttle open just a little bit and all of that is going on down here 
and we'll dismiss the yoke so that you can see what's going on. Before we do that though I just wanted to show you also that in amongst all of the custom button programming logic I have in addition to that written some further instructions with most of the switches and controls in order that they illuminate in some way when you press them. So this not only gives me a, a visual acknowledgement that a button or, or switch has been operated when using my iPad at home but it would also come in handy here in this video whereby you will actually see more readily which ones I'm operating and when. So here we go then, broadly speaking we can start top left and work across that was the push button for the rotary encoder on the GNS 530 uh, directional gyro, heading bug and you'll see that each of these have got a green and red light depending on whether you're turning it clockwise or anti-clockwise this is the push button for the other rotary encoder then each of the four uh, touch portal buttons making up the encoder itself have all got green lights so when you press those you get a little green light to flash to show that you're pressing it and then all of the push buttons on the GNS530 the two flip flop switches from COM to NAV menu direct to the clear and enter buttons CDI OBS message, uh, flight plan, the VNAV, uh, VNAV and uh, procedures buttons. And that's the other rotary encoder. Then we go on to the, uh, we've done that one already. Then we go on to the range and we've got um, zoom in and zoom out which are green and red. There's no lights on the ignition switch but you can see the um, animation. So it started and now I've pressed it again to switch the ignition off. Now we've got the autopilot buttons, heading, nav, approach, uh, reverse course, altimeter, altitude, altitude sorry, and vertical speed. Then we've got the vertical speed uh, increase and decrease. Uh, rotary knob. Then the autopilot disengage, so you push it once and it flashes and go. that flashing go, uh, ceases after a couple of seconds. Throttle and mixture, you can see the green and red, so green to push in, red when you pull out. Then we have the elevator trim, or pitch trim, so nose down green, nose up red. Then we have all the toggle switches at the bottom. Um, so when they're on, the green light will be on. And when you switch them off again, the green light also goes out. So then we've got the uh, avionics switches. There's no lights for these. You can see them working. So you don't need any lights to tell you that. Do for the toggle switches as well, but it looks nicer with the lights. So then we've got the master battery and alternator uh, toggles as well and there we are so in a minute I'm just going to um, show you uh, how this actually works in the aircraft within X-Plane um, so <clears throat> I'll inset this iPad display um, on the screen as well so hopefully with, the, with all those illuminating lights you'll be able to see which ones I'm pressing versus which uh, switch or control that is actually operating in the cockpit itself. Okay so we'll go over to the aircraft and uh, see how we get on. So here we are in our 172 Skyhawk we're at a little airport called Cranfield which is about 60 miles north of central London and the first thing we are going to do is to uh, get the engine started so we'll just come down here dismiss the yoke so that we can see what's going on switch on the master battery and then we want to switch on the fuel pump like so then we go over to here to uh, um, we want full mixture and just a crack of throttle not much at all like that um, uh, check that the parking brake is on which it is and then we'll start the engine up 
on the ignition key. There she goes, and you can see all that on the inset iPad as well, hopefully, if it's not too blurred. So then we just switch the alternator on, and we're going to put the avionics on so that we can see the Garmin GNS 530 and 430 respectively, and then we'll put our uh, lights on as required. Probably didn't need to put our landing lights on just yet until we get to the runway, but never mind. So we're going to go uh, going to do a short journey from Cranfield to the city of uh, Cambridge, um, not far away, about 30 miles. So we need to now, now uh, program our 530 accordingly. So as you know, we're at um, Cranfield, which is Echo Golf Tango Charlie. We need to go in to enter the rest of our flight plan, and the first waypoint is only Oscar Lima November Echo Yankee. It uh, probably would be quicker with a physical rotary encoder, but still very impressive that you can do it with an iPad, don't you think? Okay, nearly there. Yep. So we can enter that and put the next uh, waypoint in, which is Sivda, Sierra India, Victor, Delta, Alpha. And as you can see the flashing lights on the inset video of the iPad. So you can see I'm not using my mouse or an integral, oh sorry, an, um, a physical keyboard. It's all being done on the iPad. So we've uh, put our second waypoint in. Now we are heading to uh, Cambridge, which is uh, Echo Golf Sierra India, if I remember. Uh, sorry, Sierra Charlie, not Sierra India. Let me load that. And we are going to select our approach for Cambridge. We want ILS 23. We're going to vector in and we load that. The next thing we want is a couple of frequencies. So we start with COM1 and then uh, we'll put Cambridge um, approach frequency in which is uh, 120.965 so we press the flip-flop switch and put that in and then we want the ILS uh, frequency which is 111.3 we flip-flop that and that's now in place as well and then we want to make sure we're navigating with the GPS so we uh, press on the CDI button okay so now we need to do something with this message which basically says that the magnetic compass is not lined up with the uh, directional gyro as you can see the magnetic compass is pointing south and the gyro is a way out so that needs adjusting uh, if we uh, press the rotary knob for the directional gyro and get that set up for south that's good enough yep, so that matches now then we need to set up the heading bug uh, for the runway uh, that we're going to be taking off from which is 212 degrees so that's about that's about right there okay um, so this is the altimeter, uh, the elevation of this airport is 350 feet, so that's slightly out. Uh, standard uh, barometer pressure is 2992 at sea level, we're slightly above that, so it's uh, a little different. Then we have the VO1, VOR1 uh, OBS receiver, um, and on all that, although that's not going to play any immediate role in our flight, it will do when we... Uh, when we uh, approach Cambridge so we'll just set that up to um, 230 degrees which is the runway heading for uh, Cambridge um, ILS 23. So dismiss that bring the yoke back and then uh, we're going to start to uh, make our way over to the runway okay so here we are um, holding on runway 21 at Cranfield uh, we'll just dismiss the oak to see what's going on here so we're not going to use any flaps today trim is set 
and we can turn our uh, taxi lights off and I did do that with the iPad and not uh, my mouse <coughs> reinstate the yoke Um, we are going to Cambridge via our first waypoint, which is Olney. Uh, release the parking brake <coughs> and we start our runway roll, if I can do this properly without veering all over the runway. Put a bit of right rudder in to counteract the engine torque. Airspeed alive, 60 knots, and uh, up we go. <coughs> 10, 20, 30, 50, So shortly I'm going to um, set the aircraft on a runway heading with the autopilot, which is uh, 212 degrees. And we'll aim for an altitude of three and a half thousand feet. There goes the heading button. So we're on a, a course of two one two. Five hundred. Pull the throttle back a little bit. Now I've pressed the uh, vertical speed button and. Uh, we're climbing at, uh, I've set it to climb at 500 feet a minute. And then we'll uh, press the ALT button when we get to 3,500 feet. I've just pressed the NAV button there twice. I don't know if you saw the light flashing on the iPad insert. Um, something I didn't realize to start with but uh, with the STEC 55 autopilot you have to press the nav button twice for it to follow your flight plan pressing it once doesn't do it, it took me a while to find that out I should have read the manual but anyway we're turning to starboard to towards our first waypoint which is Olney and I increased our vertical speed a little bit to 700 feet a minute. Keep getting that mess message to say that the compass is not aligned with the direction of gyro, even though it is, so I'm not sure what's happening there. Okay, so we're now um, coming up to our first waypoint, only a um, few seconds to arrival, and we're coming up to our altitude of three and a half thousand feet, which I'll select in a minute. In fact, I've selected it now. Oh no, it's still climbing. So we've set, selected the altitude now, and as we steer around our first waypoint and then off to our second, which is Sivda, Sierra India Victor Delta Alpha. So there's not much more that you're going to see now. It's going to be a bit boring for 15 minutes until we get to our second waypoint. So, <coughs> excuse me, to speed the flight up and so as to avoid making this an unnecessarily long video, I'll uh, move the plane along as if by magic towards our second waypoint. So, here we are, a few seconds to run. I'm now going to activate. Uh, the approach because Sivda was our last waypoint before getting to Cambridge and if I didn't activate the approach we'd head straight for Cambridge without following the proper approach line. I'm also going to reduce our altitude down to our approach uh, platform altitude which is in this case is 1700 feet so we're going to decrease our altitude by 700 feet per minute Reduce the throttle slightly so we don't overspeed the engine. And now I'm going to skip on to towards our final leg, and that's the approach to Cambridge Echo Golf Sierra Charlie. 
So we are going to follow the magenta curve around on the uh, Garmin 513 uh, map. A few seconds time. Right, we're on the localizer now. I'm going to set up the heading bug uh, for the runway direction which is 230 degrees. You see the green light flashing there on the heading bug uh, dial on the iPad inset. Sorry about the long pauses. Don't like having any videos, but not much I can do to avoid them at this stage. Okay, so we're now heading towards 230 and to Cambridge. You just make out the airport, airport there with the happy lights. Now I'm going to pre uh, press the approach button. We've already switched, uh, switched from GPS to V-Lock. And we'll be starting our descent uh, quite soon. So there wasn't much going to be going on with the iPad as we uh, land at Cambridge. So we'll 200. just sit back and watch my probably horrible landing. Landings had never been my forte in X plane for some reason. You do too much flaring and floating. Fingers crossed. 50. 30. 20. Oh, too much of a flare. And another 10. one. center up on the runway a little bit and we're just going to uh, go up here for a few hundred meters and then we'll turn off um, and park up on one of the taxiways I won't, I'm sure the guys at Cambridge won't mind me doing that for a few minutes and then we'll go through the aircraft shutdown procedure using touch boards all again I must reset the brakes on this aircraft, I've got them to max effort. It's far too severe for braking. Right. I just go around onto this taxiway and pull up. Looks like a DC-10 over there. I didn't know we had those in the area. Could be military. Okay, so we're going to pull up here, put the parking brake on, and then we'll go through the sequence of shutting down the engine with the iPad. So keep an eye on the lights on the iPad. Right, okay, so there's all the lights going off in the fuel pump, and then the strobe light. Now, then we'll uh, bring the um, mixture back shut down the engine switch the battery and alternator off and then lastly the ignition turn it back to off and there we are so hopefully throughout the flight you've um, seen that I have been using the touch portal and not my mouse and keyboard So that more or less brings us to the end of this particular video, although I have to say that this uh, touch portal project was very, very much a labour of love for me, as it took many, many hours of work before getting the desired result. Uh, it may also be the case, this being my first attempt at creating custom buttons in Touch Portal to this level of detail, that there may still be one or two errors in this early project version that have yet to be ironed out. 
Anyway, the whole process initially started with the creation of each push button, toggle switch, rotary encoder, ignition switch and so on, which after a lot of trial and error I eventually managed to complete using the Microsoft PowerPoint application. In fact, I ended up with over 140 button graphics that make up all of the cockpit controls that I've shown you. Following that, each of these PowerPoint graphics had to be converted into PNG photographic files before then being imported into Touch Portal itself. And only then, after all of that, could I finally get around to programming all of the logic sequences behind each button so that they in turn would mimic what actually happens in the virtual aircraft. Now as far as button design and the programming logic behind each is concerned it sadly won't be possible for me to show you all of the relevant details here and now as it would take far too long to explain properly. If anyone is interested though I could possibly produce another video in future that will cover this more thoroughly so please by all means let me know what you think. Having said that I do hope at least that I have been able to demonstrate to you the full potential of what Touch Portal is capable of to the point whereby some of you may wish to try a project like this yourselves. So lastly then, a uh, big thank you for watching and as always if you have any questions please let me know. In the meantime, if you found this video of some help, please uh, smash the like button and don't forget also to hit the subscribe button and the bell so that you don't miss any new videos coming up. Ta-ta for now.